Well, good morning. So those of you worshiping here in person, those of you also online, my name's Mike. I'm glad you're here. If we haven't gotten to say hi, especially to those of you online, I hope you'll make a comment. Let us know you're worshiping with us. I met somebody, I think it was last week. I'm just remembering this. Be with me in my old age. But that they worship every week online, and I had never known them in the year I've been here. And so we finally got to meet in person. And I'd love to, I'm glad you're worshiping online. I'd love to say hi. And it's great to have you here. Those of you in the room, it's also great to have you here. I just get to see you and talk to you. And so if I haven't met you, I'd love to say hi after worship. Today, we are in week two of a conversation about a guy in the Bible named Jonah, the worst prophet ever. And uh, I say that uh, last week, if you were here, I uh, said that Jonah is written as satire. And a couple people asked me this week, wait, Mike, what does that mean? What does it mean to be satire? So I had to Google to make sure I gave you the right definition. Satire is using humor or exaggeration to criticize someone or something's faults. And so one of the things you're going to notice if you've been reading along in Jonah, if you've been with us through this journey, is that throughout Jonah, everything that you think should happen, almost always the opposite happens. Uh, and, and the things that do happen are almost always exaggerated. They're at times comical. And, and then the next question is, wait, if Jonah's satire, did it really happen? You know, as a real historical figure. And I, I'll let you make your own decision for that. I believe he was a real person for a couple different reasons. Number one, he's mentioned another place in the Bible. Um, I also think, though, that, that Jonah's story is, there's something really human about it. It actually connects with my story, and I suspect your story. And we're going to study it over the next several weeks. Uh, let me give you a real brief recap uh, of what we talked about last week, or a little bit of the context. I like maps. If you like maps, there you go. Um, Jonah was a real prophet. He is mentioned in 2 Kings 14 that he ministered during the time of King Jeroboam II. While he supported King Jeroboam, King Jeroboam was a little sketch. And uh, the little question about uh, his faithfulness, uh, he was evil in God's sight. But, but the other thing we learn is that Jonah hated. I mean, just think about the person that you hate, and that's how he felt about the Assyrians. By the way, I know we don't like saying the word hate in church. If I say, like, who do you hate? You're like, I don't hate anybody, Pastor Mike. Okay, who is it that make your, makes your skin crawl? Who is it that whenever you see them, you're like, eh, I'm going to go out the other door? You know, like, who is it you hate having to, not hate, who is it you dislike having to talk to at school, at work? That's it. And one of the things we're going to hear is that, that God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, which is a capital city of Assyria, the people he hated. Now, here's why I think this is so humorous. Um, God tells me, and by the way, if you're a Jesus follower, God tells you to love people who we hate, <laughs> to love people who are enemies, to pray for people who persecute us. I always have to clarify to pray good things for the people who hurt you. You know, this is part of the challenge of what it means to follow Jesus because we don't want to, and yet God says, I want you to. And that's not only Jonah's story, but that's our story. So God told him to go to Assyria, to Nineveh, the capital, and he said what? peace out. I'm going to go the exact opposite direction, which is what most of us do, but he does it in a comical way. He goes literally the furthest place to the edge of the world as they knew it, and they, he thought he'd be fine. He, he went to Tarshish, almost where it falls off the edge of the earth to escape God, and then a big wind came up, this almost exaggerated wind where he's sleeping in the middle of this chaos, it's all satire. It's all overdramatic. And I know you're thinking, why would they overdramatize this? Any of you fish? <laughs> Any of you know somebody who fishes? Ask them about the biggest fish they've ever caught. 
you'll understand satire, okay? So, so there's this big wind, and finally Jonah's cast into the sea. And God provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, we talked all about that last week. If you missed out, you can go back and listen online, or you can read it for yourself. But today, we're going to pick up with Jonah chapter 2. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called out to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. From the belly of the underworld, I cried out for help, and you have heard my voice. You had cast me into the depths of the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounds me. All your strong waves and rushing waters pass over me. So I said, I've been driven away from your sight. Will I ever look at your holy temple? Waters have grasped me to the point of death. The depth, the deep surrounds me. Seaweed is wrapped around my head at the base of the undersea mountains. I've sunk down to the underworld. Its bars held me with no end in sight. But you brought me out of the pit. When my endurance was weakening, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those deceived by worthless things lose their chance for mercy. But me, I will offer a sacrifice to you with a voice of thanks. That which I have promised, I will pray. Deliverance belong to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. This is a word of God for all of God's creation. Thanks be to God. I want to point out a couple things that I think are important to know. And you can follow along if you have your Bible. You can follow along with us about Jonah chapter 2. A couple things I want to point out. First is, why, why is Jonah in the fish? Whose fault is it? Now, what you'll notice is at the beginning, especially of Jonah's prayer, he says, you, God, have cast me into the depths in the heart of the sea. Now, whose fault is it that he's in the sea? Is it God's fault or his fault? Like, you all probably don't do this, but maybe you know a friend who who blames God for the mess they find themselves in. Like somebody who is constantly eating out or eating fast food or fried foods or putting extra salt on their fries and their popcorn and their, they don't go exercise and, and then they blame God. Why do I have, I mean, why does your friend have heart disease, right? Or, or maybe it's somebody who overworks, is always busy, doesn't spend time with a spouse and then wonder why is God breaking apart their marriage or Or maybe it's somebody who's always buying the new gadget, always buying the newest toy, the newest game, the newest clothes, the newest car, and then wonder, why why don't I have any money, God? Why have any, why do you, why? Do you ever find yourself blaming God for things that you're like, I mean, not you, but your friend? Because you all would never do that, right? We never blame our circumstances on God. You know, the truth is, I know there are many times health, con- like health concerns, relationship problems, financial problems. Those are all complicated things. And off, sometimes we're in the middle of a mess, not because of things we choose. But, but if I'm really honest with this, uh, myself, most of the time I find myself in a mess. It's because of the choices I've made. And specifically, it's about the choice that I made to run away from what God invites me to do, what God asks me to do which is Jonah's story. If he would have done what God told him to do, he wouldn't have been in the water, right? He would have been in Nineveh. He might have had some other problems, don't get me wrong, but he he wouldn't have been in the situation he found himself in. I think many times we think in our lives that that we expect our choices to, to make our lives go up and to the right. Do you know that term, up and to the right? 
here's, here's a, like a chart of it. Anybody know what that chart is? Stock market since 1900. And you'll notice like it's done pretty well, right? That's a Dow Jones specifically. There's a few dips, but it's done pretty well. That's what we think our lives should be. But what I find in my life that is while I want and expect my life to go up and to the right, oftentimes because of my own choices, it goes low, 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 low. <laughs> Last week I sang uh, uh, um, that guy Jelly Roll. Today it's Flo Rida. <laughs> Next week I'm taking requests. Come on. Um, no, no, we like, we want things to go well, and yet our, our choices, our decisions oftentimes make us do those downward plunges, those finding ourselves in the pit. There's a fascinating historical uh, note about this. In the ancient world, remember he went over the Mediterranean Sea, and the, the big seas, they couldn't, didn't know ahead of bottom, Right? They had no way to know it was a bottom. So they actually thought the bottom of the sea was the gateway, the entry into the underworld. So some cultures called it the abyss. In the Hebrew culture, they had the word called Sheol. Say the word with me, Sheol. Sheol is a word that's translated as the pit or um, the pit or I'm thinking of the other one. I know the third one. It's hell. And Sheol is a place of darkness, a place of fear. So whenever Jonah is cast into the sea, and whenever the sailors are worried about their boat breaking apart, they're not only worried about the water, they're worried about going into the underworld, the abyss, the pit. So whenever Jonah says, from the belly of the underworld, I cried out for help, he's saying, from the middle of hell, I cried out for help. And what I know, and some of you know, uh, if you've ever had a friend who's gone through like a 12-step program, 12-step programs are one of my favorite groups because they show dramatic change in people's lives. That's like the NAAA, any of the recovery programs that use the 12 steps. One of the common denominators in many people's stories is they always have to hit rock bottom. Or maybe not have to, but... They experience that as a part of their story. They hit rock bottom, they hit Sheol before they begin going up. That's actually Jonah's story. He finds himself in the pit of hell in the belly of a fish, wondering, God, why did you put me here? All the while ignoring that God is the only one who, give him, who can give him help. And that's the second thing I want to notice about this is that God is there with him even in Sheol, which is a little bit like theologically for me. To think of Sheol is a description of hell, that God is in hell with him. And I think in a more poetic way, it's to express that no matter where we are, that God is there with us. No matter where we've gone, that God is with us. That if we think about that chart, you know, that up and to the right, that almost all of us will have experienced or will experience dips and drops. But I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes the times when I experience, most God, experience God most powerfully is in the middle of that drop, in the middle of the dip, in the middle of the shale, of experience that God is there with us. And I think that's important because some of us may feel like we're in the pit right now. Some of us may be struggling or hurting or wandering or lost or broken and know that God is there with you. And that, that God is actually taking care of you. This was something I noticed for the first time this week. The fish was actually a gift from God to take care of Jonah in the middle of the abyss, right? Right? Now, he thought of it as a prison. If you remember from his prayer, he's like, out of the watery prison, I don't know if I can escape. But God, so Jonah's choices put him in the, put him in the water, put him in Sheol. But God provided the fish to protect him, to care for him, to help him. I wonder how many times 
Do we feel like something is punishment when God actually has given it as a gift? Going back to 12-step programs, I can't tell you how many times I've talked with somebody who's gone into rehab and thought it was punishment and realized it was the most powerful gift they could have ever received because it was there to help them and care for them and, and walk with them in a way that they could have never experienced on their own. I wonder how many times as we look back to those dips in our lives that God is there and that God's taking care of us even when we may not see it until years later. And here's why. Because in Sheol, in the belly of the fish, in the pit, you know what happened for Jonah? There's no other people to talk to. There's no other distractions. He didn't even have his phone to be able to play Candy Crush on. <laughs> and so when you can't do anything else, when you're all alone and you're trapped, you know what you have to do? You have to pray. <laughs> he actually said it in his prayer, out of my desperation, I turn to you. He wasn't desperate enough. And sometimes I wonder if we just need to get silent enough to hear God's voice. We have to stop being distracted. We have to stop with all the noise, with all the clutter, with all the stuff in order to hear God speak. What would it be like if we really believed that, that God, that the Lord of creation, the God of the, the sea and dry land, the God who's bigger than all of our problems, that that God wants to hear from us that God, that God is willing to hear from us and willing to answer our prayers. If we really believed it, wouldn't we talk to that God more frequently? Out of our arrogance, we just think, oh, I can make my life go up into the right of my own. And Jonah's like, no, 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 no. You need the space, the time, the gift of God to be alone. By the way, if you don't know how to be quiet, some of you may not have this problem. I have this problem. We have a specific group. Um, there's contemplative worship. There's centering prayers. There's a couple times during the week where they meet to, to just pray and listen and sit still and be quiet. Uh, next Sunday at 5 o'clock right here, we're going to have contemplative worship. It's a different way to worship that's less talky-talky and more listening-listening. To be quiet. To be still and to recognize that God is there with us. And here's the reason, the, the last lesson I want to point out from Jonah 2, is that God always gives us another chance. The last verse in Jonah 2 ends by saying, the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Probably not the deliverance he was hoping for, and yet the deliverance he needed most. Next, we're, we're going to read that Jonah finds himself at the exact same place as he did in Jonah chapter 1. But this time, things go dramatically different. Don't get me wrong, Jonah's still the worst prophet ever. You're going to hear about it. But if God can give the worst prophet ever a second chance, I'm pretty, pretty sure that God can give you and me another chance. By the way, do you remember how long Jonah was in the belly of the fish? Three days and three nights. Three days. Um, it seems like somebody else in the Bible was in the pit in Sheol, in the grave for, for three days. Anybody know who that was? Jesus. What happened on the third day? Resurrection. A new beginning a new ch chance, a new opportunity. We're actually going to share in Holy Communion, which is a reminder not only of Jesus' story, not only of Jonah's story, but if we're willing to, for our story, for you and me, if we're willing.